Welcome to today's Construction Manager and BIM Plus webinar, Hackett's Golden Thread, the role of digital in association with Autodesk. I'm very pleased to welcome today's webinar speakers. We have Dan Hollis, Fire Safety Projects Director at Clarion, Anne-Marie Friel, Partner Infrastructure at Pinson Masons, Lee Mullin, Technical Specialist at Autodesk, and I am your chair today, Will Mann, editor of Construction Manager magazine. Today's webinar program, we will be looking at the key takeaways from the government's Hackett consultation response, legal implications for building owners, designers and constructors regarding the digital asset record, using BIM and digital technology during design and construction for higher risk residential buildings, linking BIM models to asset databases, how building owners approach information management, and how should modeling and data collection be managed by designers and constructors. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. You can use the Q&A function to ask questions during presentations and the panel will answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Okay, so I'm now going to introduce our first speaker. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Anne-Marie Friel from Pinson Masons. And Anne-Marie, if you can unmute yourself and start sharing your screen. Take it away, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Will. So first, the scene setting on the genesis of the Golden Thread. Following the terrible situation, which was the Grenfell Towers tragedy, in Dame Judith Hackett's final report, which she issued in December 2018, she described the deep flaws in the current regulatory system covering high-rise residential buildings. Now, Hackett's report recommended a new regulatory framework, which was intended to drive real cultural and behavioral change. So picking out just two of the most relevant of Hackett's numerous recommendations, because there were numerous recommendations, just picking two of them for today's purposes, the Hackett report called for the introduction of systems-based thinking into buildings, and also highlighted the need for a golden thread of asset information across the life of the building from the planning stage through construction through to occupation. So what has happened since then and what do you need to know? Well, a lot has happened. In fact, within weeks of last year's Digital Construction Summit in June 2019, the government opened a short consultation containing their proposals for reform of the building safety regulatory system. In January this year, the planned reforms were announced and further detail on the planned regime was also released in April. So in terms of what we know so far about quite how dramatic these changes are likely to be, I think it's best summarised in the words of Robert Jenrick, who's the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government when he says, and I quote, it will be the biggest change to our building safety regime for 40 years. And it, sorry, bear with me. So we're talking about a major overhaul here of the current process. And it's not clear what the timetable will be for the new legislation coming into force. But what we do know is that there will be phased implementation for existing buildings and also that details will be expected in the autumn. So watch this space. But I am not anticipating significant delays on this coming into force. So what can we expect in the bill? Well, there's a massive amount to the building safety bill from a safety perspective and anyone involved in health and safety should spend time getting to grips with it. However, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly summarize some of the key features and how it deals with the golden thread of building information in particular. In the Hackett report, one of the recommendations was for a joint regulator to oversee the new regulatory framework. This regulator is now confirmed. It will be overseen by the health and safety executive, i.e. the HSE. 
Now, the involvement of the HSE is the single most important feature of this new system. And this is the particular point of the system which will drive real cultural change and which will make things feel very, very different. It actually makes a lot of sense as the new system will assign roles and responsibilities which are aligned with CDM during construction. The purpose of the new regime is to move away from complex approved documents and instead move towards goal setting legislation which leaves duty holders free to innovate and develop technical solutions but all within an overarching framework of accountability. As it happens, Dame Judith Hackett is also the former chair of the HSE. And I think she sums up one of the enforcement differences, which will, which will sit behind it when she says, it will be under the HSE umbrella and you know how the HSE operates. They don't tell you what to do. They ask you to demonstrate that you are doing what is reasonable. You also know how the HSE operates in terms of being a firm but fair regulatory body. And it won't be a minor wrap across the knuckles when you get it wrong anymore. Be under no illusions, there will be serious consequences for non-compliance. HSE will impose sanctions through the planning gateway, construction and operation phases without hesitation. There will be criminal and civil consequences of non-compliance and it will not be possible to contract out of these regulations. So let's just look for a minute at the scope of the new regulations. Now the Hackett report was concerned with high rise residue residential buildings over 30 metres, i.e. the first line in the table on these sides. The bill goes further. I guess you could call this as the domino effect of legislation like this. The bill will apply to high-risk residential buildings over 18 metres in height. So immediately, this captures more buildings than what was dealt with in the Hackett Review. However, the important point to note is that the scope is very likely to be extended over time to include other multi-occupancy residential buildings. And what this slide doesn't say is that the regulations will also apply to existing buildings as well as new developments, irrespective of the stage they've reached when the new system becomes law. But I'll spend some more time on that a little bit later. Central to these new regulations is the introduction of a gateway system. Now significant new duties will be imposed on everyone involved in the construction process aligned with CDM obligations. At each gateway, there will be overarching duties to do everything reasonably practical to ensure that the building is safe and an obligation to sign off at the end of construction to confirm that the building complies with building regulations before it's occupied. A development that will, will not basically be able to proceed through any of these three gateways unless it has approval from HSE. The three gateways are set out here. You'll see there's a gateway before planning permission, a gateway before construction, and a gateway before occupation. Gateways one and two apply to new constructions, so that's new buildings, but also to renovation upgrade and modification of existing buildings. The duty holder at these stages will be aligned with CDM process. So we're talking here about the client, the principal contractor, and the principal designer, all terms which I'm sure you know well. Gateway three will apply to new and existing buildings and duties will be split between the accountable person, who in most cases we think will be the owner, and the building manager. As I said, if schemes are partway through the process when the legislation is introduced, they'll fall into the regime and be caught by the next relevant gateway. So how does this regime bring in the golden thread of building information? Well, at gateway two, approval must be obtained before any construction work begins on site and in addition to the other requirements for submission at this gateway, you will need to submit a 3D digital model of the building as planned, including the products to be used. What level of BIM? We don't know right now. However, what we do know is that this is a significant change and is going to require much more detailed design work to be done up front. We need to consider all of the consequences of this, including cost, and in particular, who bears the cost? if gateway two approval is not obtained. And this will undoubtedly be a requirement that you need to satisfy in order to reach practical completion. Once construction begins, the principal contractor must consult with the client and the designer before deviating from the original full plans as set out in that 3D model. These are gonna be recorded in the change control plan. Now the regulator must approve any proposed major changes in advance. 
So in summary, it's going to become much more difficult to deviate from the original plans. And in our view, value engineering is likely to become much more difficult than it is currently. Now at Gateway 3, before occupation, the duty holder needs to obtain approval from the regulator before the building can be occupied. That approval takes the form of a building registration certificate. Any delay at the stage could have significant financial consequences for the project. And in many ways, this is the most onerous gateway. No certificate, no occupation. The as-built models and demonstrating compliance with change control will be key here. And while they may not be the duty holder at this stage in all cases, it will be the duty of the developer, the design team and the contractor to certify compliance with the building regulations and to hand over all of the golden thread information. So just a quick word on how the regime applies to existing buildings. This, this is important. Existing buildings will be brought into the new regime on a phase basis. They will go through the Gateway 3 approval process. Now this will be challenging for older buildings where the golden thread was not created during construction. And we're recommending that an intrusive survey be done as a first step in order to build an accurate record to support the Gateway 3 safety case for existing buildings. And just as a reminder, major refurbishment of existing buildings will also trigger the Gateway 2 process. So before I finish up with a look ahead, let's go back to 2019 and see how I did on my predictions. You'll see from last year's slide shown here that I predicted a combination of increasing reputational, contractual and regulatory risk and took a punt on a tightening insurance market. Now, I think based on the update I've just given about the new building safety bill, we can easily see that my predictions on reputational and regulatory risk will certainly come true in relation to residential buildings which are in the scope of the new law. There will be significant corporate and individual consequences, regulatory and reputational, if non-compliance has come to light. Picking up on the reputational risk alone, I also tend to think that this domino effect will apply more widely here too for buildings which sit outside the regulatory scope. Let's look at contractual risk. Last year I talked about the risk of defects and non-compliance. I think that's still the case and I'll briefly touch on the impact of the new regulations on the contractual risk position in my look ahead shortly. But let's just look at my point on a tightening insurance market. I was not quite right in my predictions here. In fact, I was too optimistic. I was hopeful last year that when I did this in 2019, that good records would help stakeholders to negotiate better PI terms through the disclosure process. In fact, what has happened is that the post Grenfell disruption to the PI market has been much more profound than that. And availability and coverage of PI insurance has been severely affected across the board. This is unfortunately liked, likely to remain the case over the short to medium term. And I don't actually think that having good digital records is likely to make any difference here. So finally, let me have another go at predicting where this is going and to look to the future. The impact of the new regulations will be intense. It's going to drive huge change in a number of areas. There will undoubtedly be a domino effect, in my opinion anyway, and this could easily become the new norm for complex buildings. The new regulations will change contract drafting and will change the approach to design development and change control. Failure to comply with the regulations will absolutely be a breach of contract, I would think in all cases, and will prevent contractual certification being achieved. Compliance with the regulations will undoubtedly have program and pricing implications. So I'm going to finish up with the same message as last year. Maintaining the status quo of poor digital records is risky and only getting riskier. And in the case of multi-occupancy high-rise residential buildings, it's very shortly about to become very illegal. If buildings are your business and you'll not get up for this change yet, then you need to get moving and ask yourself why. Because if this new regulation and framework is not enough to drive change, then I, actually I don't know what is. And if not now, then when? Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce our next speaker, and that is Lee Mullin from Autodesk. Lee, if uh, you can unmute yourself and start screen sharing and uh, take it away.
Fantastic, thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Lee Mullin. I'm a senior technical specialist for Autodesk. Um, I've been working in the field of digital construction for around 15 years now. Um, and a lot of the areas which we've been talking talking to our customers are about, about the life cycle of how uh, digitization can um, improve the whole digital construction life cycle from concept right through to operations. Um, and the problem that I think many uh, architects, engineers, con contractors have been trying to solve for a large number of years is how do we get through the challenges that tra traditional project execution exposes, which is where data at these gateways gets lost. Um, and unfortunately, from the Hackett review, that's a lot of the um, challenges which were signalled as part, which hopefully the gold of thread should help improve. So at each stage between concept and design, design to construction and then construction to operation, there's a lot of data. Sometimes this is due to the way in which technology is being employed, but more often than not, it's due to the culture and the way in which different businesses work and work with each other and how they share that data. So what I want to talk, talk about today is the fact that, yes, there's a lot of work which needs to be done to introduce Golden Thread into the industry. Um, but I also want to talk about the opportunity which it's going to provide um, you as businesses, um, whether it be as housing associations or architects or, or contractors. There's a lot of opportunities that this can provide you as well. So there's a, there's a study which happened in 2018 from the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, which indicated that 67% of existing stock um, building area will still exist in 2050. So that's two thirds of existing stock will still exist in 2050. And at the current rates of maintenance, we're looking at about between half a percent and 1% per year of that building stock is being maintained and updated. That means that we'll, out of the existing building stock we have today, um, two thirds of it will still exist. And of that, about another two thirds of that will uh, be completely unmaintained. So actually, there's a huge opportunity to look at how we do maintenance of existing stock, as well as how we address new builds. Um, and what I want to talk about today is how, how might you go about that? And um, as Anne-Marie kind of pointed out uh, earlier, one of the key areas is about how we maybe understand the built assets we already have as access to. Um, Autodesk was part of a group which through the um, Institute for Chartered Civil Engineers, uh, sorry, Chartered Institute for Civil Engineers, um, how they will look to collect asset data. And there's different approaches that you can take towards that. And we, uh, as part of these recommendations, alongside the PAS 128, we made kind of four recommendations um, from very basic, uh, from very basic, which is what is done a lot today. We look at existing as-built records. So existing drawings and documents that may be um, 30, 40, 50 years old, uh, that maybe are out of date. But actually, how can we improve those workflows? Well, often it's by doing that site verification. And again, this is something you see lots of um, surveyors are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, just validating whether those existing records are correct and up to date. Now, where we're starting to see a, a lot uh, of housing associations looking at, and particularly in the last few years uh, since, the, since Grenfell, there's been a lot of work to kind of run new surveys to understand what's been built and being able to create high quality digital records from there, whether that be CAD plans, whether that be databases, spreadsheets, be able to pull more and more information together. But what we're recommending is the best approach to be able to collect this data is to create a full building information model. And for those who aren't technical, who are on this call, I'm gonna kind of explain what that actually means because I think a lot of people have heard this term BIM uh, and probably understand kind of its uh, relation to this world, uh, but for many they don't. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Now BIM is, has for the last 15 years been attempting to improve the process flow between the different design stages. So how can we pass as much of that information that's been collected during the concept design stage 
into the more technical design stages? How can we pass that information from the designers into construction? And how can we make sure as much of that information that's being collected during construction, such as installation information, such as various commissioning information, how can we make sure that's passed on to the owner operators? Um, and really, building information mo modeling is a vehicle. That's all it is. It's a way of being able to collect this information and be able to pass it on to different groups. Um, many, many of you will have heard around the uh, BIM standards that are being implemented in the UK. So ISO 19650, which is a set of uh, international standards, which comes from originally a set of British standards, which is talking about how data should be passed off and go through certain gateways um, all the way through the construction process. Now, um, before you kind of go along any building information modeling project, we recommend that you kind of think about three key questions, particularly as an asset owner. Um, and we ask, we ask you to think about each of these individually. So firstly, we ask you to think about who. So who's going to be using the data? So if you're um, a housing association, um, what is the profile of those people that are going to be using that data? So, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second. What data are you going to be collecting? For what purposes? And how are you going to go and collect that data? Now, that's really important to understand um, what data is important for you for regu regulatory reasons. So for being able to um, demonstrate what materials have been used from what suppliers, um, at what dates, but also what information have you, uh, what data you, might you want to collect that helps you improve the operations of that particular asset. And then finally, how will you maintain that information? Um, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. It's not just about how do you maintain the information from a, um, a graphical point of view, but also how do you maintain that non-graphical information? So the first question is who's gonna be using the data? So understanding the challenge that you may, ha may have across, um, across your whole project life cycle. So what we'd recommend is really understanding the profile, <clears throat> the profile of all the individuals who might need to access this information, whether they be senior execs, whether they be surveyors on the ground, whether they be uh, people looking to do operations and maintenance um, for your tenants. And it's worth understanding a whole bunch of things like age, experience, um, what technology they're currently using, what their goals and metrics are, how they're being driven, um, and potentially what opportunities higher quality information provides them as well. This is really important to be able to understand um, what level of information are you going to provide them, and also what, uh, how, how much are you going to have to improve their skills and training to allow them to, um, to use this information effectively. Secondly, think about what data you're looking to collect and how. Um, and this is where we really BIM has, has kind of been very strong over a number of years because what building information modeling allows you to do is to take, um, is to take a particular asset and add information to it throughout the building life cycle. So at different stages, you're going to find different information available. So in those early schematic designs, in those early, you're going to be building specifications. They may not be particularly specific. They may not have manufacturers or even fire ratings and things like that at those early stages. But as we go through the process, we want to collect more and more information from the manufacturers, from the install installers out on site. And how do we collect all that information together? Well, building information modeling is simply, it's, it's a large database. It's a graphical interface to a large database of information. Um, and whilst, you know, I think I am the technology part of the, of this particular webinar, uh, I don't really want to talk too much about which technology, but I will allow you to kind of take screenshots of this. But basically you first got to think about how you offer models and we've got tools that allow you to do that. Then how do you coordinate all these different disciplines together? How do you then add um, you, things that are going to make that 
make those models more useful, such as classification checks, um, being able to start building up your Kobe. You may have heard of Kobe. It's simply a schema for how this database uh, may be surfaced, but how you then start building those checks in. Then how are you going to work across uh, multiple parties, um, across offices, uh, obviously at the moment, a lot more working from home, but how do we enable people to work and access that data from wherever they are? How do we, we then start conditioning that information and pulling additional uh, data into, let's say a particular door asset uh, or a facade panel? How do we then go out on site and then start doing that commissioning? So running those QA checks, those checklists, being able to take photos of installation, photos of um, delivery dates and uh, kind of those kind of various bits of information. And then also how do we uh, take those into operations and maintenance? And from an Autodesk point of view, we do provide tools that help all the way through the asset life cycle uh, and how you can add and augment more information throughout, your, throughout the um, building information process. Which then leads us to kind of that last question which I think is really important as not uh, as an asset operator. How are you going to maintain the data? Um, and the important thing to think about here is the fact that um, a physical building is a living building. There's always changes which are happening. Um, in the education space, these may be changes which are happening where um, the layouts are changing, the, Changes, there's changes in the use of rooms, for example. Um, however, in buildings, those changes might, uh, in residential buildings, those changes may not be as frequent, may not be as often, but you will still be having changes to boilers. You will still be having potentially changes to facades every few years as well. So being able to collect this information becomes more and more important for that asset owner. Um, and throughout this whole process, you'll notice that the reliance on the graphical data becomes less so and the, date, the reliance upon the attribute data becomes more so. So how are you going to, um, how are you going to um, add more and more of that attribute data that's useful to you for regulation purposes, but also for an operations purposes? And building information modeling isn't just about providing that regu regulatory compliance. Um, in fact, this is a study from 2013, Penn State University in the United States, which talks about other ways in which building information modeling can benefit you, whether you're um, a designer, whether you're a developer, um, or whether you're a housing association or other owner. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways these models can be used in different ways. And this kind of leads me quite nicely onto um, our final speaker, which I'll let Will introduce. But Clarion have been going through this process of first surveying an existing building. Um, and they're going to talk more about how they used laser scanning technology to create a high quality survey. So instead of lots of individual points and checking against drawings, we're creating a complex 3D model with millions of points, which allow for things like measurements to be able to, to be taken from the office. Uh, but this also allows the building of a building information model. So every single facade panel, every single window can then have information associated with it. So who is the manufacturer or what is the particular fire rating um, or material of that particular item? Um, and then they're using a uh, they're using a tool called Active Plan to take that into facilities management, and I'm sure Dan's going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but broadly, I'd like you to think when you're thinking about the technology, don't just think when you're thinking about how we bring in these new processes, don't just think about the technology. Firstly, think about the processes. The processes are often there. Um, between the ISO 19650 standards and the 1192 British standard, which was released a few years ago, um, and the 128 standard that's also been released, a lot of these processes are already there. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Lots of um, architects, engineers, contractors are already working in this way or moving towards working in this way. So think about the processes of how people work together. Technology is a key part um, and at Autodesk we look to provide 
technology that speaks together. So we're not building lots of individual silos in technology, um, which hopefully will allow you to work together more closely as a set of uh, built environment specialists to get to the end of the project. But most importantly, I would say is think about the people. Think about who's going to be involved in these projects because there's lots of different considerations you need to think about. Think about the culture um, that's provided across the projects. Um, now, what culture do you have in your business? What culture do you have with your supply chains? Because that's going to then impact how you can deliver this golden thread. Think about procurement. Um, and I would say think very, very seriously about procurement because procurement drives behaviours. Um, the Hackett Review kind of surfaced a lot of the challenges that the industry's got around um, we, a, lot, a lot of providers will do the minimum that's needed. If you have those more integrated procurement models, everyone's working towards the same goal. Everyone is taking on the same risk. Um, it may cost more but in the long run, it may cost a lot less. So think about um, how procurement is driving the behaviors that you want for your project. Think about education. Um, and this isn't just um, what skills are you going to need to use certain technologies, but think about what education uh, your whole company is going to need and your supply chain are going to need to understand these new processes, to understand how the data that they're collecting will impact others. Um, and how the information that you need um, to be able to do certain compliance or to be able to run certain tasks, how important that is for you. So think about how you're going to educate the rest of your teams. And finally, then think about training. Um, so as well as education, you need to think about how do we not cut corners on training? How do we make um, one reference, which I've heard many people use when it comes to particularly software training, is you've often got incredibly powerful tools. Uh, think of it maybe like a chainsaw. If you give someone a chainsaw and they don't have the training, they may be able to use it, they may, not be able, they may be able to use it without injuring anyone, but they're not going to be particularly effective. Training allows you to kind of really uh, improve the quality that you're working to. Um, so that's the end of my presentation, so I'll pass back to Will. Thank you very much for that, Lee. Uh, and now um, I'm pleased to welcome our third and final speaker, Dan Hollis from Clarion Housing. Dan, um, if you can start sharing your screen and uh, take it away. My name's Dan Hollis. I'm the Project Fire Director for uh, Clarion Housing Association. So Clarion are the UK's largest housing association. Um, we are, um, we, we've got 125,000 buildings across uh, across England um, and uh, this is our 3D project so digitized dimensional data um, so this is what we've done in terms of um, taking it essentially from an asset management perspective so we were looking at the um, implications of Hacky um, what those the recommendations that um, Anne-Marie uh, highlighted earlier and thought look how can we how can we do that how can we create our own our own building safety case file for our HRRBs, our higher risk residential buildings. Also, we're saying, you know, um, uh, how can we create our golden thread of information? So our first approach was to say, look, can we get some 2D drawings? We looked at that and actually what we found was that um, the 2D drawings for our existing buildings was, were, were costing us around uh, £10,000 just for a physical drawing of the building. So we went to digital construction, the digital construction event in November 28, and we thought we went to the Leica stand there and we saw that they'd got a, a scanner and we decided to do our own. So really what we wanted to do was to uh, collect the data, um, uh, develop the data for a fire safety perspective and to um, uh, scan the building. And this is what we did. So. We scanned the building ourselves, so my, our surveyors, so we went around using the, the Leica scanner. Uh, so this particular building here is a, um, a tower block in um, Orpington in South London. Um, so the reason it's so dark is we did it in the middle of December. Um, so you can see where it is in the location in, uh, um, in Orpington, and you can see all the different elements of, 
it's a 12 story building. Um, and we did this through the point cloud system. We thought it would be really difficult. And actually, um, it, was, it was pretty straightforward in terms of doing the scanning. Um, and you can see that, you know, you can get the data within perhaps, I think this scanner goes at a 0. Uh, this scanner goes to a six mil, um, uh, six mil um, error rate. And you can see that, um, oh, my video stopped, hasn't it? Sorry, so you can see that, so, oh, apologies. Um, if I just move it along a little bit, I know this is a, um, I suppose that, that uh, you can see, I suppose, that the, the real advantages it's got from both internally and externally. What we had to do with the, the modeling is um, look at the, uh, uh, look at the building overall, pick out a, a specific, um, uh, a specific flat and then model that all the way through the building because they're essentially, they were essentially the same footprint. There's two building types in there. And as uh, Lee was saying, the, the, the day that the thing that we learned, I suppose, from this was that when we molded it, we were really excited about the visuals. And what we, the more we got into it, the more we were excited about was the, um, sorry, my video is not uh, uh, working any further than that, so apologies. But what we got more excited about was, was the data set that came from it. So if you are a housing association like ourselves, understanding how you can manage and organize that, organize that data, so for example, fire doors, the accreditation, the information, to how you can then, you know, both from a regulatory and an asset management perspective, use that information real, you know, in the real working environment. It was really, really exciting. So, you know, we wanted to program our major works. Um, you can do that by giving a digital file. Um, you can have detailed knowledge of the component. So, you know, does the fire door work? Does it not work? You know, can you tag the, um, uh, the dry riser inlet, all those sorts of things that a regulator needs to know or a, com you know, a compliance manager needs to know, they're, they're there and they're, they're done through this, um, this, this method of scanning. It also helps us understand the stock for all our, all our stock. So rather than making assumptions, we've got real and accurate data, um, which from a maintenance perspective, we, we, we're always making assumptions. This is real important information and we think that we can significantly save the uh significantly save the amount of uh, uh make some significant savings through this through this process it also allows us to analyze and program our works better and it gives our residents like uh, a, a better understanding of what we're what we're doing so what we did on this particular example is that we, we looked at uh, tagging all the fire doors and you can see those in blue uh on the left and it, it and you can put the uh, the certification for that you can um, uh, make sure it's verified you know you can make uh, make it easily usable by a range of different people the visuals allow you to do that and also you can you know generally improve the data um, as you're as you're progressing from so you, you look at creating a standard set of data and then develop that data up in a more detailed way as you overlay more and more more and more information over time but it, you know what we found was important was to just really just focus on the um, uh, focus on the core asset information requirements first um, so our next so we have scanned a few buildings um, uh, what we've decided to do now is so we, we've created the proof of concept um, uh, we're going through a trial stage at the moment so looking at different models different uh, different solutions for for our high risk residential buildings. And then our next approach is to, to roll that out across all our high risk residential buildings. So we've got um, about 120, 120 sites across, which, are, which will fall into the HRRB category. And um, we've done the trial on, on, a, on, on a, a, I suppose, with the first five buildings that we've, we've had, a, had a go at, and we're looking at which is the best solution for us, and then for, to roll that out. What we think it'll give us is, um, you know, the aim really is to demonstrate a 3D model with a database that's got assets, to assets tagged in space and the asset data is attached and this tag can work, you know, it just will, will improve the quality of our, uh, the management of our stock. Um, it'll, you know, it'll give us great assurance on compliance. It'll give greater benefits in terms of, 
um, fire safety. Um, but I think for me, it will give us a real better understanding of our assets and our asset management strategy. Um, so what we want to use is sort of like the technology to improve the quality of the, uh, the stock. It'll allow, you know, we want it to be dynamic in a way that we can get our operatives to update the information um, uh, when they're out on site. Um, it can, we can communicate to our, our customers and show them information, have that interaction and make sure that uh, it's, um, uh, it's a practical way of um, uh, uh, of moving the uh, uh, moving the uh, moving the digital asset along by creating this digital uh, this digital model, perhaps this digital this digital twin. Um, so, you know, just over our, I suppose the proof of concept, we did two, we've got two two providers. Um, we're giving data for fire safety equipment only. Uh, I've got a point cloud. We'll provide the point cloud and the data for all the fire safety equipment within the block. And then the supplier will use a um, 3D model, assets tagged with a 3D model, systems that link with a tag, the functionality to allow reports that are run from that data set, and the data to be accessed from both top down and bottom up. Uh, and to provide this system in a database that the planning can use for a, for a period of three months. So um, I suppose that's, that's where we are. We're, we're um, um, we're well on the way to um, uh, deliver it, you know, delivering the, the, the first stage of that um, uh, that project. But um, uh, happy to take any uh, happy to take any questions on it. Dan, that was great. Um, many thanks for that. Um, really interesting presentation. Um, I am um, now going to move to the Q and A session um, with uh, the other panelists. And I'll bring those back now. I'm just going to turn off your screen sharing now, Dan. Thanks. Okay, so um, quite a few questions, as I'm sure you might expect. Um, one that goes to uh, Dan and Lee, really, um, and that comes from Daniel Cooling, who asks, how did you get from recap to Revit versions of the BIM models? Uh, yeah, Dan, do you want to share how you did it in your case? And I'm happy to share maybe how others have done it as well. Yeah, if you do your, your bit, Lee, I'd perhaps uh, yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, no, <laughs> so there's multiple ways in which you can kind of move from a point cloud into a building information model. Um, a few years ago, this was all done fairly manually. So people were taking the point cloud and then using it as a reference uh, within the uh, Revit, Revit software in our case. Um, think of it the same way they would have underlaid a PDF or a DWG file, CAD file, um, and then use that as a reference. Um, what we're seeing now is a lot of providers are providing plugins to tools like Revit to allow automation of certain things like walls, windows, pipes, things like that as well. So um, a lot of this can now be start to be automated um, but we still think you know there's, there's an involvement of an individual sat at a machine kind of verifying that the data that they're seeing in the point cloud is correct uh, in the model that they're creating. Yeah I mean I suppose from, from our perspective we took the model we worked with um, we're with PRP architects and we worked with um, uh, uh, Autodesk and that's that sort of created that uh, uh, created that model, but we, we did have to check um, uh, in a in a fair amount of detail what we what we were doing just to make sure and just to understand the sort of granularity about how it was working. I think in the in the longer term, we expect that to be a, a much more automated process. Um, but because we wanted to understand how it worked and how the, the, the relationships between the different systems, um, it was something that was. Um, uh, something we did in um, a granular in a granular way. Uh, Dan, um, a question from Andy Burrows, who says, mm. "How was the internal mapping done?" Uh, so we attend, So we on, on that particular example I showed you, um, we had um, uh, we t we just went into two, into two flats, uh, and we put the scanner in the in a, in a couple of different places in each in, in each room. Um, what we found 
Um, and you know, people were pretty, uh, pretty helpful, and they were quite interested, really, um, in, in, in us doing it. But what we found, one of the challenges that we found was from a, a data protection perspective that our scan, the scanner, particularly the second scanner we used, we hired, we hired from Leica. It was so good. It was, you know, it was taking all sorts of information. So we had to go through and sort of take the um, people's photographs off the wall, and you know, it, it was that was, to be honest, our um, our, our, our our biggest um, our biggest challenge. But yeah, no, we put the scanner in the room. We, we let it take some some scans, and um, and then moved on to the next room, and then just knitted it all together. Um, so it was like, a, you know. Re much more straightforward than you think. I mean, to give you an idea of the cost, the scanner itself, we, we didn't buy the scanner. So the scanner was like, um, I think the first scanner we hired was like 18,000 uh, pounds to buy, but we hired it and it cost about 100, 180 pounds a day. And um, it took us about a week to do the building. Partly that's because the, the you know, we were learning about it. But it was also so it cost us like less than a thousand pounds to take the scans itself, um, which was really. And, and then when we went, we, we upgraded the model when we did the next build, and we thought we'll get the next sort of uh, the higher standard uh, like a model, uh, like a scanner. And that was um, so that's like about sixty thousand pounds to buy. But hiring it was about I think it was uh, about four hundred pounds a day. But the real advantage with it was that the quality of the images were. Was significantly better, um, and the um, uh, it was much quicker. So you know we saved a fair amount of t fair amount of time. You do have to be wary from a social housing perspective. You do have to be wary about making sure because these these are expensive pieces of equipment. Um, you have to be wary. You know, be considered when you're uh, when you're walking around um, uh, in public with these 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 sorts of pieces of equipment. Um, uh, but it was like uh, you know. Um, relatively straightforward. And Dan, one one other attendee asks if you had to use drones at all, or was it all taken from a static point the survey? Did you catch that, Dan? Yeah. So um, we're all taken from the floor. So that the quality of the scanner was was easily able to cope with the height of the building. Um, so yeah, um, and but to be honest, we'd love to have a go with the drones. Um, that would be something that we'd be really keen to try out. Um, you know, it's quite quite exciting um, possibility. Um, but we will be able to do it just from the ground. Okay, and a question from Vanessa Oricon who asks about um, whether you already had in-house surveyors and did they already use Reddit, Revit, or was there additional? training required uh, and you might want to follow up on that one Lee. Uh, so we um, we just did it ourselves really. Um, uh, we found up obviously went to the digital construction event which was great um, and then uh, we spoke to the company that hires them out so essentially we, we went up we used two different scanners we used the Leica one and then we tried it with um, the Faro uh, Faro Faro scanner um, uh, with the Leica uh, company, which are wholly owned by Leica. Uh, they they gave a little training package with us. Are really good, um, uh, and and it, it, it was it's it was relatively straightforward. We were just interested in trying to do it, um, so there was no particular specialist expertise. Okay, Lee, did you want to say anything about that topic in relation to training? Um, yeah, I can do. Yeah, so. I think I hopefully touched it on my, on that last piece where I think you've got you've got to consider who's going to be using the data, who's going to own the data, um, how much you're looking to subcontract some of this work out, how much you're actually looking at this as maybe a longer term plan. Um, as as BIM, like I say, as BIM is just a vehicle as a way to collect more information about a particular asset. Um, if you treat Revit as that database, I think there's value in housing providers looking at having these skills in-house. Um, obviously, we've got quite a large number of um, service partners who can help with that training, um, but there's also a lot of other companies who can help um, if you did want to outsource any of that 
as well. Thanks, Lee. Uh, and Dan, uh, one or two people have asked about how you actually uh, defined or differentiated data requirements, data requirements of uh, different maintainable assets. Do, do you want to just say a, a little bit about that, how, how granular you went? So we, we, I suppose we started because we kept this, kept this, we started this project from a, essentially a, um, a fire safety perspective. We started off looking at what we, from a compliance perspective, what we capture already and what we, what we think we ought to capture. Um, and then, uh, and then worked on it from, uh, uh, from that basis. So you, you know, like your, your doors and your windows, it, you know, if you're, if you're really, uh, you know, if you're doing a new build, then you really do, it would be really interesting to see, you know, what screws you're using um, throughout, you know, throughout the building. But I think from a asset management perspective, the key for us was to think about the, um, the, you know, the, the actual practical requirements about what we, what we needed to capture um, and what was important to us. And we've gone through that list. And I think what we need to do again is revisit that and look at what our asset information requirements are again, in terms of setting the standard for when we roll this, roll this project out. Because it's very, very easy to get uh, a little bit carried away and try and capture too much information. Um, and actually thinking strategically at the start about what you want to what you want to capture, how you want to use it, and then and then capturing it is 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 critical for giving your project um, a realistic amount of scope. Okay, great, thanks, Dan. Um, Anne Marie, we've had one or two questions um, about the scope of the the bill that is looming, and uh, the the buildings that are likely um, to come under the new legislation. Um, I know you've answered one. Do, do you want to just say I've a little answered, bit more about that? I've actually answered about three. I've been I've been beavering away answering the kind of more tedious legal questions because there's so much more interesting questions for Dan now that everybody's seen it. Actually, <laughs> I didn't I didn't want to steal still Dan's thunder because I know that's the part that most of you are really interested in. There's been a lot of questions about scope. I've tried to give an answer. I mean it, it's it's impossible to tell really um, and all I'm doing here really is getting off the fence and trying to give a view on what we think um, public policy would support in terms of the um, extension of the scope of, the, of this new system. Um, to other multi-occupancy residential buildings. And it really is a public policy um, kind of direction of travel that makes us think it is likely at some point in future. I think it's impossible to tell when this will happen. I think trying to predict this, um, you know, early in, sorry, in the middle of the COVID crisis in 2020 before the new bill has actually become law is frankly impossible. And I, I would have thought that, um, what the government were looking to do here was to give a chance for the new regulations to sort of bid down and settle in um, industry become used to it you know inevitably with these things the first year or so will be you know some things will go well some things probably not so well everybody will learn I would expect that there'll be a number of satellite industries um, that uh, sort of are created around this in the same way that they do around any new legislation um, be that CDM or, or anything else um, industry tends to react and respond consultants rebadge and, and rebrand in order to deal with it. Um, and I think once it's sort of settled down, we may well then see good political reasons and it will require, I would have thought, some political support for extending this. I do think, as I said in my presentation, that there will be a domino effect. And by the domino effect, I also mean that once industry has got used to doing things this way, what you, what you will sometimes see is in the procurement process, you might see, um, clients whose assets are not within the scope deciding that actually you know what I like this approach so I'm going to just require this in my contracts anyway and that's I think what I mean by the domino effect but I, I think it's really too early to predict with any certainty it's a, it's a matter of watch the space I what I hope there isn't is a kind of trigger event which is high profile because you, you can imagine that if there was a particular type sometimes this stuff is quite um, reactive rather than proactive so you can imagine if there was a, a, a to be a bad incident um, which was not covered by the legislation that might be the kind of thing that accelerates political support for extension of the regulations sorry that's a far too long legal answer but I have 
I will continue to beaver away and try and answer what I can on the um, tedious legal stuff. Dan, get on with your interesting bit. Well, I'm afraid we're, we're actually now um, out of time. Um, a very interesting topic and um, three excellent speakers um, who I'd like to thank once again. And I'd also like to thank our partners today, Autodesk. Um, this webinar will be available on demand on the Construction Manager website. And you can also find out about other upcoming digital events at constructionmanagermagazine.com and bimplus.co.uk. Um, so thanks once again for tuning in and, and thanks again to our panellists and to Autodesk. <laughs>